Okay, so welcome along. Uh, my name is David Lindo. This is In Conservation With, and without further ado, I'd like, you to, I'd like to introduce you to Mark, Mark Carwardin. Now, Mark, can you hear me? I can, yes. Can you hear me all right? Let me ask you this one question I wanted to, always wanted to ask you. Are you ready? Yeah, ready. <laughs> How do you pronounce your surname? Car <laughs> Carwardin. I worked out once that I've spent about three weeks of my life spelling my surname and telling people how to pronounce it. Just call me Mark. <laughs> well, Mark, um, you are a zoologist, um, a conservationist, um, an outspoken one at that, uh, a TV and radio presenter, um, a best selling author, uh, a magazine columnist, um, a wildlife photographer of world renowned. Um, have you got time for anything else in your life at all? About your family? You've got family? <laughs> yes, I have a wife, new wife from December, Deborah. Oh, congratulations. Um, thank you very much. Yes, it took a long time to find the time for the wedding, but um, we did. Um, yeah, I, I do work long hours, I have to say, but the, tr the thing is, it's a passion. I mean, I'm sure you're the same, you know, even on my days off, I'm watching wildlife and um, so it all sort of runs into one another. I don't feel like there's work and there's time off. You know, I mean, when we finish tonight, I'll be in the garden setting up a trap, a camera tra trap, sounded wrong, uh, to photograph badgers for fun. Um, so is that work? Is that, I mean, it all, it all um, blends into one. So yes, I do long hours, but it's all fantastic. Well, that's good. I mean, the question I want to ask you as well is, I mean, <clears throat> obviously you're a zoologist and, you know, conservationist but where did it all start I mean did the young Mark come into this world thinking about whales and cetaceans or were you how did it all start for you um well apparently according to my parents I've ever since I was walking and talking I loved wildlife <clears throat> you know did what we all do collect beetles in matchboxes and all that kind of thing when I was five or six and then there was one moment and actually one of my earliest memories when I was about six and we were in St James's Park in London and my dad sprinkled seeds over my arms I put my arms out and on the top of my head and I got covered in pigeons and sparrows and I even now remember thinking oh my god this is fantastic this is this is what I want to do every day and so I've always wanted to be involved with wildlife it's been a lifelong passion it's in the blood and um i did a zoology degree and then whale watching was um just by chance so i was on a whale watching trip in california half a day during university holidays uh never seen a whale before in my life and nothing happened for about two hours i remember off the coast of california and um suddenly this huge whale uh, a grey whale breached literally right in front of where I was standing. And it was such a shock that I almost swallowed my tongue, but I still can see it. I mean, this was, you know, 39 years ago, and I can still see this 35 tonne grey whale flying through the air, almost like it's in slow motion. And I still remember thinking, that is what I want to do. And uh, I've been very lucky to make whales, dolphins and porpoises a big part of my life ever since. And uh, I've been watching them all those years since. And what was your first TV break? Um, well, I sort of, I sort of became. I, I, my first job was working for the World Wildlife Fund, as it was then. It's my only proper job I've ever had. Um, and I sort of became almost like rent a mouth doing, um, you know, interviews on any conservation subject when I needed somebody to comment. And so I got a lot of experience just doing one-off interviews and um, fell into radio, um, which was, uh, I mean, all, my whole life has been one lucky encounter after another. There's a, there's a great Woody Allen quote I'm always quoting where he says, how do you make God laugh? And the answer is telling me future plans. And I think that sums it up perfectly. Never sort of planned anything, but I've, I've, I've just had lots of lucky opportunities. So I was doing a radio interview in the BBC Natural History Unit for a Radio 4 programme called um, the Natural History Programme and the presenter at the time was ill and I ended up presenting the programme and uh, 
a month later, and that was with a lot of hand-holding, a lot of help with the people there. I'd never done anything like it before in my life. And then um, a month later, they axed that series, which had been going on Radio 4 for donkey's years, started a new one called Nature. And I somehow got offered the job of presenting Nature. So I got the experience doing radio every week and then got to know all the people in the natural history unit. And, you know, one thing led to another. And the, I did a, a TV series on um, the Natural History Museum in London, which was fantastic. Six programmes jointly presented with, with a bunch of other people behind the scenes in the museum and just realized I loved the whole process of making TV programs and then developed Last Chance to See, which was a, a series basically retracing steps I'd made 20 years earlier, a sort of natural progression. Yeah, let's talk about Last Chance to See because that, that's probably the series that a lot of people know you for. Um, and you were with uh, Stephen Fry. I, I absolutely adore him. I think his diction is amazing. What was he like to work with, firstly, before we talk about the programme itself? He was fantastic. Fun. We, became, we didn't really know one another, and it's actually quite a risk, because we spent uh, probably about seven months travelling the world together, and that's, you know, sharing tents and, uh, you know, sleeping rough and uh, really tough travel. So you get to know one another pretty well. If we hadn't got on, um, it would have been a disaster. Um, but we got on like a house on fire, and we're completely different people in, in every way. I mean, he's... He's six foot five, you know, he's about five, six inches taller than me. He always made me feel very short. Got a brain the size of a planet. He can remember everything. So you have dinner with him and he'll, we'll be chatting about a movie or something. And he would, he would know the name of the key grip. He'd know all the actors and actresses personally. He would uh, know the budget, where it was shot, who wrote the different scripts. And I would be saying, what's the name of that actress, you know, with the hair, like he's married to the guy who, and I can't remember anything. So he complete opposites, but he, so he's a great challenge to work with. You know, he, I was supposed to be the expert and I had to try and keep one step ahead of him. I kept telling him, you mustn't read up on, you know, online what we're doing next because I'm supposed to be the expert because he'd, you know, read up and he'd, he, he devoured books like there's no tomorrow and remembered every single word. But he was also, as well as being challenging, fantastic fun. I mean, we had, we were in fits of giggles the whole time and, um, we just laughed our way through seven months of traveling. And I remember I had to learn a lot about TV presenting with him because he didn't like discussing anything. So we'd be somewhere and the director would say, right, we're going to talk about whatever we'd found. A lot of it was sort of quite, as we went, we didn't plan too much. Um, and we'd chat away and talk about anything but the subject. And then they'd say, right, ready. And off we go. And we'd just do it. And he'd expect it to be done in one take. And, you know, we, we very, very rarely did a second take because he's such a professional and so brilliant at it. I mean, he lives on television. So I really enjoyed being put under that sort of pressure and learning very fast as we went. Fantastic. Tell us about the premise of the, the programme. Well, Last Chance See has actually been, it's been part of my life for 30 years now. Um, it started with a round the world trip with Douglas Adams. Um, I won't bore you with the story how I met Douglas, but we we met and uh, got on really well. And we decided to just to interrupt. Uh, sorry, just uh, Douglas Adams is the author of Hitch the Hitch Up the yes. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Easy for you to say. No wonder you can't pronounce Carbordi. <laughs> I'm not even drinking, <laughs> <laughs> and I am. Um, yeah, Douglas was, he, he, he was, um, you know, major um, writer, had a huge, huge following. Very sadly, he died in um, May 2001, Amy age 49. He would have had a lot more to offer the world. But um, yeah, so he wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and was best known for that. And again, we were completely different. He brilliant brain the size of a planet, brilliant lateral thinker. And the idea was to travel around the world looking for endangered species and to sort of have a different look at them, meet the people who are trying to protect them along the way, bumble about trying to find them in the first place and introduce conservation to people who wouldn't normally think about conservation. And Douglas was obviously the perfect partner to do that. The idea being I would sort of introduce him to everything and everyone and he would have this lateral take on, um, on, on the species we we're looking at. So, you know, for example, an eye eye. As a zoologist, I'd describe an eye eye as a, as a nocturnal lemur, you know, with big ears and with a long, thin middle finger 
it's all very boring. Douglas comes along and says, well, it looks like somebody's, you know, stuck lots of bits of other animals together to make it. So it's got a squirrel's tail, it's got eyes like E.T., it's got ears like bat, a bat's ears, it's got teeth like a beaver's teeth and a cat's body and so on. And Stephen Fry then, we, we then did a return journey um, 20 years later to see how everything had fared and Stephen Fry came along and said, well, it looks like someone's tried to turn a bat into a cat. You know, it's, it's just a different way of looking at it. And the whole concept, we did a book and a radio series of our year of travels was to get people interested when it's quite hard to get people not into wildlife interested in conservation and then when Douglas sadly died we decided to um, or I decided you know to go and have a look and, and see how 20 years later everything was doing and we had you know mixed results some had gone some were doing quite well and I asked Stephen Fry if he'd take Douglas's place and we then went back around the world and made a tv series and, a, and another book Fantastic. And uh, you had a lot of really interesting experiences. I mean, obviously the most famous is a Kakapo incident, which I've, I've, I'm sure you've told people a hundred times, but make it 101 times. Well, this Kakapo is Sirocco. You see, the Kakapo, you couldn't make a Kakapo up. It's a nocturnal parrot. Uh, it smells like a musty clarinet case. Uh, the male blows itself up to the size and shape of a football and then has a song that sounds like a collection of Pink Floyd studio outtakes. And um, this particular Kakapo Sirocco had been raised by people. He's still around, he'll outlive, he'll outlive us. They live to about a hundred years or more. And um, he thought he was a person, um, but he's got this great big sharp beak like a can opener and was actually quite scary. So he'd been scaring volunteers on this island off New Zealand where they'd put him for safekeeping, Codfish Island. He'd leap out in the dark and grab people by the leg and so on and um, he was quite a character and when we met him he decided to suddenly climb up on top of me and basically shagged my head and um, it was very painful I have to say but it was obvious at the time this was going to make good telly and he became a real star as a result of that clip and he's got a massive following in New Zealand he's got his own website with an introduction by the Prime Minister of New Zealand he tweets obviously he does personal appearances and um, it's absolutely fantastic because th they, they say that it was that episode, that little clip with Sirocco shagging my head that put the Kakapo on the map and they suddenly got swamped with people wanting to volunteer, they got more funding and now people around the world have heard of a Kakapo and know what a Kakapo is which is fantastic. So I always joke that I'm going to try and do that for rhinos next see if that will get the rhinos on the map. Yes, try and shag as many animals as possible. <laughs> well, that, it is interesting because, you know, a lot of people have devoted their lives to trying to protect the kakapo. And that the trick is to capture people's imagination. And that is always the challenge in conservation. You can have all the experts in the world, you know, the likes of us talking away and giving facts and so on. And all it takes is a silly little thing that just captures people's imagination. And suddenly it's headline news, it's got you know, 100 million hits on YouTube and it's out there and that's all you need. If we could not get shagged by everything, but you know, just find something that captures people's imagination, then you can get more endangered species um, into people's um, heads. So how do you capture the imagination of the public whilst doing a live, you know, presenting a live while watching experience? Well, where, I, you know, I don't understand why everyone's not obsessed with whales. I don't know why you do birds. Whales, you know, pound for camp pound, you get more whales. And they're, they're much more exciting in so many ways, as you'll discover. Um, no, in fact, I put a few pictures together to show you just to rave about whales, tell you why I love them and what's so special about them. Before you do, um, I need to ask you, I want to ask you a couple more questions, actually, um, just before we get into the whales. Um, firstly, you're a busy man. How did you, how did you kind of get through lockdown? Um, well, I, I mean, like everybody, it's been tough. You know, I mean, um, all my work for the rest of the year was cancelled. Um, so, yes, it's be, I, I prefer life not in lockdown, I have to say. But I, I've sort of found myself as busy as ever, just having to, you know, reinvent, basically. I mean, um, 
it's been nice being at home. It's the longest I've been at home in one stretch since I was 21, I was working out, which is something. So that's been very nice. And I've, I've been busy doing new projects. So I'm setting up a YouTube channel on wildlife photography and writing lots of eBooks on wildlife photography. And um, mainly between you and me, because it's a great excuse to do more wildlife photography. So, you know, the badger photography tonight will probably be part of all of that as well. I want to do it, but it'll be part of work. There's the overlap. So, um, and it's been nice to catch up. I mean, I, 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 was, I worked out before lockdown, I was 78 trips behind in my editing and processing of photos. Um, and now I'm 57. So <laughs> I'm working through all of those. So you've got, you've got to try and make the most of it. One thing I can't do is just sit and watch telly or do nothing. So I think you're the same. You know, you see a big gap and within a day it's full. Exactly. Um, uh, all you Zoomers, by the way, you must get Mark's ebook on photography, in your latest one. What's it called again? Well, it sounds really boring. It's, it's digital workflow for wildlife photographers, but it's about um, getting the pictures onto the computer, working through Lightroom and Photoshop and getting them out the other end as complete masterpieces. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, I've seen a copy of it um, and it's absolutely stunning, the images in there. Now, you've actually written uh, about six million books. I mean, you, you quoted 50, but I think it's more than that. Um, I've actually got one. I found, I've got one myself. Oh, wow. I heard somebody bought that one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell me, I mean, I'm really fascinated by people's processes in terms of writing. I mean, we had Stephen Moss here the other day. Mm, I saw um, that, yeah. He, um, he writes a book every two minutes, so it's, you know, whilst we're actually having a conversation. I'm ahead of him. We have a private little competition. We have lunch every so often, say, right, how many now? And I would keep leapfrogging, but I'm just beating him at the moment, I have to say. Oh, I didn't realise that. <laughs> anyway, what is your process? How do you, how do you work um, when you're writing a book? Um, well, I've got ideas coming out of my ears. I, I, think, I think that's one of my big... That rhymes. Problems. Pardon? That kind of rhymes. Yeah, it does. I, as I was saying, I was thinking this is going to sound very silly. I've got lots of ideas because um, so much interests me. And um, that, that's my big downfall, really, because it's just never ending. So, you know, I, I rave about it to my agent and then we meet the publisher and we all rave about it and everyone gets excited. I sign a contract, then I go home and think, ah, got to write the book now. That's the hard bit. You know, I love the idea bit and developing the idea and writing the proposal. Um, I think I'm like, like lots of writers. I, I'm much better close to the deadline. So I don't really start. I, I think it's actually running around in my head all the time. Certainly with articles, I find that by the time I sit down to start writing an article, it's pretty much done. I don't quite know that I'm doing it, but it's, it's obviously just in the subconscious so I never sit down with a blank screen and wonder what to write I'm off and once I start writing I'm really quick um, with some of the books what I love about them is that there's a lot of research so even though they might be my subjects there's a lot of research to get the absolute latest information you know reading lots of scientific papers and that kind of thing so I love that process and then I say when I start writing it's actually really quite quick so the publishers are always wanting to see sample copy and that kind of thing and they never quite understand that no no it's not going to start coming until well actually way after the deadline I have to say, I, i've missed every deadline but not by too much actually that's not true i've just done a book called the handbook of whales dolphins and porpoises which is probably the hardest one i've ever done in my life came out last november it was six years work and it was six years late the publisher luckily stuck with me. It just became a bigger and bigger and bigger book. Uh, I sort of see that as a bit of my life's work, really. It's so much hard work, but it's very satisfying seeing it and thinking, yeah, that's it, I've done that. Are you, um, like in birding, you know, people are listers. Are you a cetacean lister? Yeah, and I, 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 I do love birds as well, I have to say. I mean, I, I'm a I'm keen bird watcher as well. I was joking. I, I, there's not a single animal I think, oh, it's only a such and such. You know, whales are my really big lifelong passion, but I'll happily spend an evening in the garden just watching all the birds on the feeders and, and you know, go bird watching. So I was kidding, I do love birds as well. Um, I've got eight more species to see. There are, depends on how you do the list, but there are 90 species of 
interpretation, including one that hasn't been officially named yet called the, it's got a catchy working title, if you like, of the dwarf bird's beaked whale, um, which we know exists, but it's not official. So if you include that, there's 90, and I've seen 82 species. So I've got a few more to see, a few beaked whales. And then, you know, the, 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 the list is in a state of flux. Like, not, we're not quite as bad as ornithologists who keep naming birds like there's no tomorrow. Um, but the whale world, you know, when I did a, a field guide to whales probably 25 years ago, and there were 76 species then. So we're up to 90 now. And it's partly discovering entirely new species, but it's also splitting species and then others get lumped back together again. You know how it works. It's a, it's a constant state of flux, but yeah. 82 hours with 90 is the short answer. That's pretty good. You would have been proud of me a few years ago. I was at Bird Fair doing their kind of um, quiz they do, which is like, um, what's it called again, where you have to... Oh, yeah, I know. Bird Brain of Britain or something, yeah. No, no, no. The one where you have to guess the least... Um, they ask 100 people. Oh, I know, yeah. I, I can't I remember the name of the program at the moment. Yeah. But um, basically, um, I was up and my partner, in fact, all of us um, had partners. So it was myself, um, there was uh, Miranda, uh, Christoph Knikov, yeah. And um, and um, Nick Baker and I think Martin Hughes Games and we're all yeah. together. And the round was citations of uh, the UK and you had to mention or say the name of the citation that has been recorded the least in the UK. And I was thinking, oh God, I need Mark here with me now. And um, I was worried because Miranda went first and said, Curvier's beak whale. And I was thinking, how can I beat that? But anyway, my, my kid was, you know, my, because my, we all had um, uh, kids with us, but the kid went first. Yeah. And my kid said, oh, um, kill a whale. And I was thinking, oh no. And then the thing went, <laughs> and it stopped at about 80. And I was thinking, that's it, I'm out. So my round came and suddenly, from nowhere, I just said, no, war. And uh, people laughed at me because Mike Dilger was actually hosting the evening. And then, we went to the school board thing and he went <laughs> all the way down to four and I've got the best answer. Well, that's a really difficult question because there's quite a few things that have only been a, appeared once. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure I'd have got that. I probably would have said bowhead whale because there was that one that appeared off Cornwall a few years ago. But um, yeah, that's a tricky one. That's the sort of one you could, you could argue late into the night over, which was the right answer. But anyway, Thank congratulations. And one more question before you show us your whales. Um, the beleaguered beluga that turned up in the Thames, mm. why do you think it came that far south? I don't know, the one off Gravesend, I don't know. It's, um, we get these odd whales that just appear and, and um, some survive, some vanish, we don't know where they've gone. There was that northern bottlenose whale, of course, in the, right outside the Houses of Parliament that died. Um, they do wander. I mean, certainly younger animals do wander, but, but species like beluga, which would normally live in the Arctic, are a long, long way from their nearest home. You're talking Svalbard, Spitsbergen, really, or maybe off the coast of Greenland, but it's a hell of a long way out of its normal range. So it could have got lost in a storm or something could have happened and it sort of just kept going in the wrong direction. Um, we don't really know the answer. They, they do appear in the strangest places and then disappear, or if they're not well, they of course strand, run aground and, and generally die. Um, but over many years, or since people have been taking an interest, we've had the odd individual whale just turn up, like the narwhal, like the bowhead, and so on, with no obvious answer. They're very hard animals to study. You know, it's, it's really hard to look at an animal like a single beluga off, off Kent, and work out what's happened, where it's come from. There's no other belugas around. You know, maybe if there are others then appeared off the coast of France or something, you might be able to piece a picture together. Um, it's really difficult. Just one of those things, they do wander and they do get lost. And, um, you know, they, one thing we think is that they're, when, they're, when they're navigating, one way of navigating is following the Earth's magnetic field. And one theory for whales stranding is that there's a blip in the Earth's magnetic field, a temporary blip, and they follow in the wrong direction. And it may well be a combination of that and a storm and something that just set it in the wrong direction. And then it just it turns up in the most unexpected place.
Yeah. Well, I think that leads us beautifully on to uh, your tell you, you telling us about the whales in more detail, I suppose. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, so just whilst uh, Mark is doing that, all your Zoomers, if you want to see this um, in the best possible way, try and switch um, to speak of you so that you just see the image and you just see and hear Mark um, as opposed to seeing everyone in the rogues gallery. So if you go to speak of you, um, and I think it's up at the top where it says gallery view, if you click that, I think, or not click it, I can't remember which one, maybe Claire can, can type it out for you. But if you look uh, on speak of you, you'll see it better. Okay, sorry about that, Mark. Okay, well, I've just picked out a few, um, what I hope are pretty pictures of different whales, and I thought I'd rave about what I find so special about them. and. Um, talk a little bit about uh, trying to watch them and trying to photograph them. So just for a few minutes here. So this is a humpback whale in Alaska with its wonderful blow there in the background. Oops, now I'm not able to change. Let me see if I can, I'm trying to, I might have to do, hang on a second. Is there a bit of um, technical difficulty there? Yeah, can I? Let me just try that one more time. How's that? Can you see a different picture? I can see you at the moment. Oh, can you? Okay. Um... Mark, you might need to share part of the screen. Okay, let me try that again. There you go. Perfect. How about if I do it, let me just... Um... Get rid of the. How about that? And you can see the picture down the side. Don't look at those. There you are. <laughs> okay, don't feel tempted. Not professional, but we'll try. Let's see. Okay, let's see what happens here. So um, these are killer whales, and that's another blow or spout, um, which is really distinctive. It's, it's often the first thing you see when you're watching for whales. Um, this is against a very dark background with the sun shining through it. So it really, I love photographing whale spouts against the light you can see all that wonderful moisture and that's actually a mixture of things so it's uh, it's almost like um, i think there's three different ingredients one is it's warm air coming out from inside the whale into cooler air outside so it condenses another is as the whale surfaces there's water caught in its blowhole and it starts blowing before it breaks the surface there's a bit of seawater and the third thing is just moisture from inside the lungs like when we sneeze and the combination of those makes this wonderful, wonderful blow. There's another killer whale. One of the things I love about them is they're so enigmatic. We know so little about even what we think of as familiar species like killer whales. You know, they're very difficult animals to study. One, what I, there's a, the way to describe it, I, I, I um, love this description, is if you imagine you're studying giraffes and you go to the savanna and the giraffes are right there. You know, you park next to them, you watch them, and at night time you bring out your night glasses and you watch them at night. You, we should know everything there is to know about giraffes. It's easy. But if you imagine you go to the savannah and it's thick fog, you have to climb a tree to look out over the, the, the sea of fog, and every so often a giraffe snout pops up. Could be over there, could be over here, could be behind you. And then while you're looking for the snout to try and work out what it is, what it's doing, where it is, somebody's shaking your tree. And then somebody in the tree opposite throwing a bucket of cold water over you every few minutes. That's what it's like studying whales. You know, they spend a lot of their time far out at sea, long way from shore, um, most of their time underwater. Uh, it's amazing we know anything about them at all. Oh, hang on, this is not working again. There we are. Part of it's their size. Um, this is a, a blue whale. This was taken a few years ago in Baja, California, in Mexico, one of my favorite places on the planet, just surfacing under the bow of the boat. Blue whale, we're talking about a whale that is roughly the length of a Boeing 737. It's the biggest animal on the planet. Um, you've got to be a lump of rock not to be moved by an encounter like that. It's the most extraordinary creature. Uh, the longest blue whale ever recorded was 110 foot three inches long and the heaviest was 190 tons. They are the most amazing animals to be out at sea next to. And they eat these guys. 
this is a uh, they eat krill and these these are pelagic red crabs or lobster krill and they don't eat them one by one of course that would be that would take them forever but they're eating typically about 40 million of these pelagic red crabs every day you know so in terms of weight a blue whale is eating the equivalent of a fully grown african elephant that's four tons every day so they're they're pretty impressive animals um here we are um and i said they spend a lot of time below the ocean waves and out of sight underwater which is why they're so difficult to study this is a sperm whale diving and the sperm whale as far as we know dives deeper than any of the others so the the deepest dive actually recorded with a sperm whale was 3933 meters that's a that's a very deep dive and it was underwater another one sorry was underwater for 138 minutes so it's holding its breath it's an air breathing mammal like us and it's holding its breath for 138 minutes which is mind boggling i feel sorry for you mentioned the cuvier's beach well david yeah. um cuvier's beach well is is comes number two the longest dive ever recorded for one of those 137 minutes 30 seconds so it missed the world record by 30 seconds feel a bit sorry for it there's all sorts of amazing facts about all sorts of whales. This was an encounter. I was, I was running a trip to Wrangell Island in Russia a couple of years ago, up in the Russian Far East. It's a, it's a magical place. It's wonderful for whales and lots of other wildlife. And we had um, an afternoon with a lot of bowhead whales and grey whales around the boats and the odd humpback. This is a bowhead that came right by the bow. The many interesting things about bowhead whales, I mean, they, they can sing two songs at the same time they can sing in two voices but to me the most extraordinary thing is they grow to a, a really old age now we know very little about this quite hard to measure the age of whales but some bowhead whales have been measured using a technique looking at the amino acids in the lenses of their eyes quite a complex technique but it's quite tried and tested and, and accepted and out of four bowheads that have been measured one of them was 211 years old and it had been killed by aboriginal whalers quite fit and healthy so we have no idea whether that whale could have lived another 10 50 100 200 years but certainly they're living a couple of centuries which is which is a pretty amazing feat and they're also amazingly inquisitive and friendly so this is um, back in Baja, California. This is in a lagoon called San Ignacio Lagoon. I know quite a lot of people watching have been here. So hopefully this brings back happy memories for you all. If I had, to, if I had one day left um, before that was it, I would go to San Ignacio Lagoon and spend it with the gray whales there because they go there to breed. Um, but most of the time they've got nothing to do. So they actually get quite bored. And that's where we come in. We go out in these little boats and um, the whales come up to us and they like to be scratched and tickled um, i mean it, you can't believe this is a this is a 45 foot gray whale and it lies next to the boat and it lets people rub its mouth rub its lips it'll like roll upside down it'll be tickled on its tummy and it it comes specifically for that people say well you, you mustn't touch wild animals and and in most cases i agree that's true you know you mustn't touch mountain gorillas and so on it's a complete no-no but if you don't touch these gray whales they'll come and find a boatload of people who do and i've seen it so many times you can't deny it's entirely on their terms so it's actually quite hard to tell who's supposed to be watching whom we go out whale watching but they're there human watching this is alongside the bigger boat that we use and this is a mother on the left and the calf on the right this is one of the crew members um, who's actually rubbing the calf with a brush and the calf is loving it. I mean, that, that's an incredible wildlife encounter. This was a, a grey whale that came alongside the small boat I was in and suddenly surfaced without any warning and opened its mouth right next to me. I mean, I, I didn't even look through the, the camera lens to take the shot. These are all its baleen plates that hang down from the upper jaw. They form a sieve and it takes a big mouthful of seabed in fact and seawater and sieves all the all the the mush and the mud and the sand and the water out through the sieve or all, all the little food the little crustaceans it's eating get caught on the inside 
they're very dramatic animals to watch as well. So these are humpback whales off Norway. Um, and the one with its tail up in the air is actually slapping its tail on the surface of the water. It's called lobtailing. And, it's, and they do a lot of this kind of thing, even though they spend most of their lives underwater, they can be very dramatic to watch from the surface. This is actually from the air. This is a fin whale feeding, showing it can almost open its mouth to a, an angle of 90 degrees. And you see that amazing throat down there. When you see big whales, filter feeding whales, or baleen whales as they're called, feeding from the air, they look like giant tadpoles. And that's its throat expanded like a concertina. And it'll squeeze it all back in to squeeze all the water out back through the sieves you can see their baleen plates up on the top jaw there and then it'll be nice and sleek it looks like a completely different animal there's another fin whale it's just closing its mouth and its throat still going back in uh, to make it that nice sleek fin whale this is another humpback whale nothing they do not all species but some is breach they leap out of the water so this is a you know 40 ton humpback whale leaping out of the water it's like watching a juggernaut leave the water have a look at this little sequence oh not going to work i have to go through it there's one and there's a second one coming out it's very exciting the most i've seen is a humpback whale breach nearly 200 times in a row and we still don't quite know what it's all about there's all sorts of theories it's probably signaling they do it to fight maybe for play all sorts of possible reasons, but it uses a lot of energy. It's amazing yeah, that they can haul themselves up that weight though. Well, I was in the water with a humpback whale once that suddenly started breaching, which is great for an adrenaline rush. And um, it didn't go that deep. It went to about 30 feet down, swam along, couple of kicks of its tail, pointed up to the surface, and it was completely out of the water. I mean, the power in the tail is phenomenal. These are bottlenose dolphins, um, which are just, good fun to watch. They're bow riding. I was using a GoPro, a little mini camera on a stick and leaning out over the bow to get a picture backwards. Um, bow riding in beautiful clear water. They all jostle for position in the very center point on the bow where they can be pushed along without moving a muscle. They just lock themselves there. And then if they hit a wave slightly or another one pushes it out, different dolphin gets into that prime position. And it's, it's fantastic fun watching them. I mean, just it's very unscientific but watching whales and dolphins just makes you feel good and there have actually been studies particularly with dolphins that they're very good for people with um, depression and that kind of thing they they help people come out of themselves this is a well, common dolphin it's interesting because when you're on a, a boat that's not well watching and suddenly um, you know like a ferry or something and suddenly some dolphins come alongside automatically everyone's going <gasps> Oh, it just raises everyone's spirits. I've seen it so many, it changes people's lives. It sounds, you know, melodramatic to say so, but well, they changed my life. But so many people who've come on trips with me have gone away and changed career or just booked another whale watching trip straight away. And it is addictive. You know, I, this is, you asked how I was with lockdown, but I think the hardest thing about lockdown is not seeing any whales and dolphins. I'm used to seeing them at regular intervals, you know, during life. And, um, this is the longest I've been without seeing one, so it's tough. These are Hector's dolphins in New Zealand, which are brilliant fun to watch. They're always racing around the boat and everyone's racing after them. You get to the bow where they are and then they suddenly dive underneath and go to the back and you race to the back and they appear on the side or they leap over small boats. It's fantastic. But the challenge, this is my, a typical day in my office. This is in the Sea of Ochotsk in um, Russia. You know, the challenge of watching them and often you're faced with pretty tough weather. That's the, the, the difficulty. And one of the things I love is trying to photograph them. And of course, you're, you're, you're wanting days like this, ideally. Nice, calm days. And I, this is me, um, this is actually in the mid-1960s when I was testing a prototype underwater camera. So I've been in and around water all my life. Still haven't really got the hang of it. Still learning. Um, this is, that's a really bad look, actually. I don't know why I put that picture in and I've got to get a more Shackleton looking outfit but this is off Baffin Island um, in Arctic Canada trying to photograph narwhal and you basically wait on this particular occasion I waited for a couple of weeks for them to come by they migrate past the flow edge so that's that day one 
This is day two, day three, day four. But eventually they came. I mean, it was a long wait. Fantastic fun, polar bears and king eiders and stuff coming past. So it wasn't boring. And eventually got a few shots of narwhal. Probably if I had to pick one whale that I, I, I love watching more than any other, probably narwhal, because they're so hard to find. That great long tusk of the male. And then I got a shot of a, a young one. That's a, a young male, a few years old, with a little diddy baby tusk. Are they the, uh, the original, original unicorn? Yeah, that's where they, uh, the, the myth came from. In fact, traders centuries ago used to pretend that narwhal tusks were from the unicorn. And they actually, any, any evidence coming out from the Arctic of a, of a whale with a tusk, they tried to um, get rid of and carry, pretend that the unicorn still existed. So, I mean, they're still traded. It's a, it's a big issue, um, narwhal tusks. You can't trade them around the world. That's illegal now, but they're still being hunted and the tusks sold in places like Canada. This is the underwater shot of um, Amazon river dolphins or pink river dolphins. I spent a week in the Amazon photographing them. And I wanted to get underwater shots, but funnily enough, the one I love the most is that. You see what's going on there. I think this is, this is the only picture, as far as I know, of any whale, dolphin or porpoise peeing. And that's one, I love the fact one of them's laughing and the other one's rolling upside down and peeing. And I've got a theory. I've got absolutely no idea if this is true or not, but there's a fish in the Amazon called a candy roo fish. And they warn you, don't swim in the Amazon and don't pee. Because if you pee, it'll swim up your urine, go into your willy, and it's got these spines like an umbrella that go doing, and then it gets stuck in your willy, which is a big problem in the app, well, it's a big problem anywhere but really big problem in the Amazon. Um, and I wonder if the Amazon river dolphins have the same problems. They have to roll upside down to pee. Would make a, a really great PhD project, that. PhD, yeah. Uh, it looks quite small. Oh, very good, I like that. That. Pardon? He looks a bit small. If you, this uh, one? No, no, the, the dolphin um, peeing. Yes. Yeah, I always imagine right. dolphins, you know, having... Well, whales do. I mean, I know what you're trying to say. I mean, um, the, the testicles of a, of a southern right whale weigh half a ton each. And the penis of some of the bigger whales are six, seven feet long, which is why they never wear shorts, but not so much in the Amazon River dolphin. So this one is a, it's a, it's a photo that whale aficionados will be interested in because this is a, a brooder's whale um, named after a, a whaler, unfortunately. And they virtually never breach and I've seen them many, many times over the years. Um, and only on one occasion have I seen them breach, and this was the occasion. Sometimes you're just lucky. This is a fin where we had an, an amazing encounter, beautiful, flat, calm conditions. And this fin well just came alongside the boat. You know what it's like with wildlife? You, you, you Mark? very exciting and 40 minutes goes like that and I managed to run around different decks different positions get all sorts of different shots it's the best finwell encounter I've ever had some of it's just luck as well just patterns so when short fin pilot whales surface you get this wonderful arc of um, water just in the shape of its forehead and I managed to get a sequence of shots and one that one was just right before the water hit the surface also trying to get behavior, of course. This is a killer whale with a squid eye. We were filming for Big Blue Live and um, it was very frustrating because I was on camera wanting to take pictures. I'd managed to get this one shot. But the, the, the killer whales had caught this giant squid and we saw them on the water with it, this family group. And then after a while, there was a, an eye floating and this killer whale took the eye in its mouth and actually swam to the boat and hand almost dropped the eye to the, us in the boat and pulled back a little bit, almost like a dog giving us a stick. It was the most extraordinary experience. This, if I had to pick one picture that probably means the most to me, I would say it's this. This is a Yangtze river dolphin or Baiji. It was taken in captivity. There was one famous Yangtze river dolphin called Chi Chi, lived in captivity in Wuhan in China, where the coronavirus, of course, is thought to have started in a wet market in Wuhan. And this 
dolphin was rescued from a fishing hook and was in captivity to 22 years. And only a few of us have got pictures of Yangtze River dolphins of this Chichi, no others, uh, none of them in the wild. And of course, this was declared extinct in 2007. So it's a very special picture to me and it, it means a lot. It's one of our few records that this dolphin ever, ever existed. Some are just special because they're unbelievably hard to photograph. This is a harbour porpoise. This was actually in the Bay of Fundy in Canada. Um, but you get lots of harbour porpoises around the coast of Britain. You very rarely see much of them. So you just see the, the dorsal fin and the top of the back. And in the Bay of Fundy, they tend to come out of the water a bit more. So I went there to photograph them and, and did get a shot that I was quite pleased with. Minky well, as well as another one you get around the coast of Britain. Um, this is all about the water, of course. It's a, it's a fabulous whale, but that water is what makes the photograph. And I've got very few good pictures of minkies. This is a dwarf minky off in, in the coast of, sorry, off the coast of Australia. Just a couple more. I've done quite a lot of photography from the air, from light aircraft. This is a humpback whale in Iceland. And what makes the shot to me is all those ripples. You'd be amazed how many times that gets published and they crop out the ripples. <laughs> And to me, that's what makes the photograph. Um, um, just two or three more, I think. This is a blue whale mum and calf. I mean, the calf, they give birth to calves that are three tons and they're about 22, 23 feet long. I mean, imagine doing that. Um, and a couple more. This is a short fin pilot whale. And I think my last one, another brooder's whale. Again, a very difficult whale to see and photograph. It's got three ridges is one of the ways you identify brooders whales on the top of its head that tells you brooders and that's the lot just to whet your appetite a little bit look we could i'm sure i'm speaking for everyone here i could watch we could watch these pictures all day look at these pictures absolutely stunning um, oh, amazing especially with a group of animals that as you say are hardly ever um seen um, before I open up the floor for a couple of questions, um, I must tell you about my experience. I had a close encounter with the whale. I, I was on a, a trip in Antarctic, and um, we were, it's calm seas right by the coast of uh, South Shetland, I think it was. Blue skies, icebergs, and all that sort of stuff. It's beautiful. And all of a sudden, I heard, <laughs> and I smelt this. Such an evocative sound, isn't it? Oh, it's incredible. And I, and I, it's really close and I smelt this really fishy bad breath smell. <laughs> and then I turned around and there was this Antarctic minke whale about maybe 10 meters long coming wow. straight towards my dinghy. And I had six people in my, in my, in my, um, my, my boat, my, my cat, what's it called again? Zodiac, my Zodiac. Zodiac, yeah. And it was coming and coming and coming. And, and I had this fear, love, all these emotions suddenly just came to me at once. And then it went straight under my Zodiac and it tilted its head and looked at us as it went underneath. And he could have flicked his tail and whacked us into the sea in two seconds. But instead, as you said earlier, he was curious. He was coming around all of us. And it was, everyone was silent. And occasionally when it came up and, and, went and, and, and blew, people would go, <gasps> but it was such an emotional moment. And, and I felt that if I wasn't interested in nature, I would have been totally interested from that very second. Yeah, it's hard not to be blown away by. It's interesting in the Antarctic, Antarctic minke whales and humpbacks are associating with boats much more than they used to. Um, it might be with humpbacks, certainly the numbers are increasing. It's one of the success stories. Um, but yeah, certainly when I first started going down there 30 years ago, virtually never happened. But now that kind of encounter is actually becoming more, I wouldn't say it's common. You're very lucky to have it, but um, more regular, which is quite interesting. And yeah, everybody who has an encounter like that comes away loving whales. You can't be anything but. Amazing. Uh, right, um, Zoomers, um, anyone with a question? If you want to ask a question, if you can go to the particip participants bit and wave your hand, and then we can see who's got a question. So anyone got a question? Whilst you're thinking of your questions, anyone there at all? Whilst you're thinking, I've got a question for you, Mark. What's the best way of detecting cetaceans for a novice? Because it's like, you know, birding and whaling, watching whales as far as I'm concerned. You know, you're looking at tons and tons of waves. Um, <laughs> occasionally you think you've seen something, you know, blow, but it was just, you know, some waves whacking together and causing a bit of spray. You sell um, it really well. 
<laughs> Sorry? You sell it really well. <laughs> so how do you, how, how do you, how well, you come on a trip with me because we see whales all the time. No, I mean, um, well, there's two ways of doing it. You can go on an organised trip and obviously they're in places where they know there are whales and dolphins and they know generally where to find them and their experience at finding them. So most commercial whale watching trips are so confident nowadays they, they give you money back if you don't get to see them. Um, but if you're doing it yourself, I mean, even in Britain, we have, a, we have a good number of whales and dolphins and porpoises around our coast. The west coast is the best area, and there are certain hot spots. I mean, Shetland and the Orkneys are particularly good, but many other places are fantastic. There are resident bottlenose dolphins, for example, in the Murray Firth in Scotland, in Cardigan Bay, around the Channel Islands, along the south coast, and so on. Um, and you can watch them from headlands even, don't even have to go out in a boat. So I'm looking for anything, any sort of thing that looks weird. I'm scanning with binoculars all the time and you might get a sudden flash of light. It might be a little glint of the sun off the back of the whale or the dorsal fin gives you the first hint or something that looks a bit like a weird wave but isn't. Or you're looking for the blow, of course. Or with dolphins, if there's a big school of dolphins, it looks like rough water. So even miles away from shore, it looks just like there's a patch of rough water and you look through binoculars and sure enough, it's a school of dolphins swimming along really fast and making splashes. So there's all sorts of different hints. It, it's, it's like, like bird watching and it's the same with identification. It's like jizz with bird watching. You, the more you do, the more you get your eye in. So, you know, it's very interesting. You can, you know, be with a bunch of people and the people who are used to doing it generally spot the whales. I mean, other people do as well. But once you get your eye in, the people there on a, on a one-week trip or a two-week trip, by the end of it, they're spotting many, many more whales. So it's just those little hints and little things that you might overlook otherwise. You just register, have a closer look through binoculars, and with a bit of luck, it'll be a whale. That's it. Patricia Pearl has a question. Hello. I just said, hi, Mark. Hello. Um, <clears throat> I've seen at least one other person from the famous Resolute, which is a famous ship now after it's in It is, yes, it's infamous. Famous. <laughs> um, and I said, how are Wales reacting to lockdown? I've heard that their behaviours are changing due to the reduced oil tanker traffic. Well, I don't think anyone knows for sure, but it's got to be a good thing. I mean, there, there's less, less disturbance out there. You know, I mean, um, there are many, many threats to whales and, and you know apart from all the obvious stuff like whaling and um, habitat destruction and disturbance but noise is one of the key ones and uh, if there's less noise then it's easier for them to operate they they need better hear as much as we need to be able to see and um, you know even in places with a lot of whale watching boats there's going to be a, it's going to be easier for them with less disturbance i mean many places it's very well regulated other places it's a free-for-all and with less big shipping, that's also going to be a good thing. Another big problem for some species is ship strikes. So there's a very rare whale called the North Atlantic right whale down to the last 430 or so. And its big threat is being hit by ships. And so they reckon there are fewer hits because there are fewer ships, which is, which is good. If you have one good year, then with, it, with a small population like that, that can make quite a big difference. Um, so I think it can be, it's probably a good thing. I mean, it's not such a good thing from um, other points of view. A lot of our research is done from whale watching boats, of course. Um, and so there's going to be a, a whole season or even several seasons with much less information, which makes it much more difficult then to compare year on year. Uh, but I think overall, it would be fair to say that whales probably are doing quite well from lockdown. Um, a lot of other animals aren't, of course. I mean, there's all sorts of problems with poaching for big mammals in, in Africa and Asia, where tourists are the eyes and ears on the ground, yeah. and where tourists are bringing money in for conservation and that kind of thing. So we're very worried they're actually suffering during lockdown, but fingers crossed Wales are, are doing okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Jay Varley, you have a question. Hi, Mark. Hello, hello, how are you? Good, thanks. Good. Question about orca. Yeah. Given that there are 
such geographic separations between different orca populations and different behaviours. What do you think is going to happen about the speciation of them? That's a really interesting question and I, there's no easy answer. I mean, um, as you know, the, what's done at the moment is a very clever way of sort of solving that without solving it. As you know, Danny, that they, yeah, they've, they've divided killer whale populations in different parts of the world into different ecotypes. So at the last count, I think there's more than 40 ecotypes have been proposed. Uh, the most famous ones are the ones in the North Pacific where all this research was originally done, where you have what are called transient killer whales, resident killer whales and offshore killer whales. And they all are completely different. You can tell by appearance which one is which. They look different, although at first glance they all just look like killer whales. They have different family groups, um, different ways of operating together, different prey. So transients, for example, feed on marine mammals and residents and offshore jaws feed on predominantly fish. In fact, all the local wildlife can tell the difference. So what amazes me is you'll see, for example, um, Darl's porpoises bow riding in front of resident killer whales, which eat fish because they know they're residents, they know that we're not going to harm them, but they don't go anywhere near, they scarper if there are transient meat-eating killer whales around. So the wild, local wildlife can tell. Um, the big question, as you were asking, is do all these different ecotypes equal different species? And that's a very heated debate in the whale world. My guess, the short answer is, we're probably going to see the transient killer whale separated as a different species um, in the not too distant future. That seems to be the one, certainly that we know the best and is very, very distinctive um, in its behavior and prey and everything else. Um, whether that will then be the beginning of a slippery slope and we'll find all the others uh, separated out as species I don't know in terms of of evolution that certainly seems to be what's happening you know they reckon that the transients and the residents for example have been separated on an evolutionary basis for about 700,000 years so it does look like they are there is speciation going on at what point we decide they're separate species and name them as <coughs> is the big controversy Okay, um, so Mark Smith, can you turn your microphone off, please, if you don't mind? Thank you. Um, Hilary McBean, thank you very much, by the way, uh, Jay Varley. I'm not sure what your J stands for. Jenny. Jane? Jenny. Jenny, hello, Jenny. Thank you very much for your question. Hilary McBean. Hello, hello, very nice to see you, and hello, hello. Mark. Um, thanks, it's been absolutely fascinating. I love the photographs. Oh, um, obviously, whale watching. Uh, up until recently has been growing and growing and growing around the world, people coming out from all sorts of different countries. Um, I'm wondering what the protocol is to control how it goes on to avoid over disturbance of the whales. Um, I, yeah. I've done a bit of whale watching, I was lucky enough to do it in the North Atlantic and the company was very responsible. We had a look at a group of uh, blue whales actually, it was amazing, but after a reasonably short time, we backed off because the blue whales were interacting and didn't want to disturb them anymore. But our other people uh, was off Greenland. Oh, right, okay. Um, it was amazing, astonishing, because they were coming in from all directions. It was like a congregation. I could see blue whales there, that's great. Yeah, oh yes, it was a, a fa fantastic. But it has worried me somewhat over, around the world. There's lots of different boats are coming out from lots of different countries. Yeah. That Whether there's a protocol to control all this activity. Well, there isn't, there isn't. It's a really, a really key point because whale watching, as you say, has grown exponentially. I think the last count, 119 countries around the world have got commercial whale watching. And um, again, the last count was some years ago, but 13 million people paid to go whale watching each year it's probably much more than that now and that means there's a lot of boats out with the whales and it, there, it's a lot of places in the world have regulations um, some of them are very strictly enforced uh, for example the killer whales off Vancouver Island there are people out on boats watching all the time not the whales but the whale watch operators and the other boats and they tell them off if they do something wrong um, and it's very strict. There's strict regulations about how close you can go, how many boats there can be around one group of whales, and so on. There are other places with similar regulations, but no enforcement. And there are other places with no regulations. And a lot of that then is based on how 
well behaved the boat operator is and that also varies from fantastic where they're brilliant they do exactly what you describe if they think they might be disturbing the whales they'll move away and so on and others who are diabolical and i've seen whale watch operators actually run over whales and cut them with their propellers which is obviously oh. completely unacceptable there's a lot of organizations and a lot of individual people who are fighting country by country to get regulations in place and get proper enforcement which can be official or can be voluntary um, and it's it's definitely improving it's getting a lot better um, but it's a bit of catch up you know it's grown exponentially and that it's, it's been so fast that we're still catching up i feel quite, quite positive that you know in the, in the next few years we will get most of it under control um, but we've still got quite a long way to go Okay, Hilary. Okay, you've gone quiet, but you're welcome. <laughs> okay, well, listen, we've kind of come to the hour mark. Um, so I want to say that we have a few more questions which we'll uh, address in the after show bit after the end of the official hour and a bit. Okay. But Mark, let me just quickly ask you um, you say you watch birds and stuff, obviously, you do. What is your favorite bird, by the way? Kakapo. <laughs> What else is there? We still keep in touch. It's one of my best friends. <laughs> well, I'm on Facebook, I suppose. But apart from the kakapo, I, it would be um, tawny owl. I did a school project on tawny owls and I've loved them ever since and can hear them from here. And it, it, you know, you're talking about the whale blow being so evocative, but the, the tawny owl hooting is, is, is one of my favorite sounds in the animal kingdom. So I, it would have to be them. But you know, like I said earlier, then I, I never look at a bird and think, or any animal and think, oh, it's just a such and such. Get pleasure out of them all. Yeah, because for me, there's uh, two four-letter words in this world, just and only. Yeah, exactly. What is your yeah. favourite mammal? Apart from narwhal and grey whale. Mm, well, badger, I think, because um, I've been campaigning all my adult life to stop um, the government killing badgers. Uh, to try and solve the tuberculosis program and have a, a real passion for badgers but again it's so hard it, if you ask me tomorrow probably be a different answer i love bears bear watching fantastic um yeah how can you how anyone can not love wildlife and get you know blown away by it all i just don't know you know it's really hard to pick one what's your favorite bird my favorite bird is the ring oozle oh right um, long story, but it's a ring oozle. And my favourite mammal, um, in fact, my favourite mammal is actually my favourite animal of all, and it's uh, a puma, cougar. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So if you could be anywhere in this world, <laughs> Mark, notwithstanding the, uh, the, the pandemic at the moment, where would you be right now? Um, how many can I have? The first one I would be one. probably top of the list, I'd be Baja California, whale watching in Mexico. It is probably my favourite place on the planet. And I've been going there every winter all my life again for 30 years and still love it and look forward to it. South Georgia would be close. Iceland, if Iceland really does stop whaling, which looks quite promising, then I'd put Iceland back up there on the list. I love there. Uh, Pantanal, that's, that's up there. Um, the Great Bear Rainforest, I could keep going. They'd be my top five. How about that? All right. Um just to let everyone know, tomorrow we have Paul Hackett here talking about the basics of phone scoping, and that particular session is five pounds ahead. Um, but three will be on Wednesday will be Lizzie Bruce, who's the um, warden at Snettisham and Titchwell in Norfolk. She's the RSPB Nature Reserve Warden. She's going to be talking about how to run a nature reserve. On Thursday, we have um, an interview with one of Britain's most celebrated nature writers, and that's Robert McFarlane. He'll be here talking about what makes him tick. And on Friday, we're going back into the water and talking about fish with Jack Perks. So that'd be uh, amazing. So please tune in. You've got a busy in. week. Sorry? You've got a busy week. <laughs> so, um, Listen, thank you so much, Mark, for sparing your time. It was really great. I mean, I've known you for a few years now, but this, is, this has been really nice to sort of uh, spend some virtual time with you today. So thank you, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you. 
and I'd like to thank everyone who came today, all you Zoomers for, for coming along and being involved. And don't forget to uh, take care of yourselves and your families and keep looking up.